him a monstrosity. The kind of horrendous figure children fear seeing in their closets and under their beds at night. Stories are told about creatures like me around the campfire. All sorts of myths and legends about snatching up unsuspecting victims and consuming the souls of the innocent. But it's not all true. I am a cryptid, yes. But instead of hunting and or viciously maiming you, I'm the force that protects you, keeps you safe, and makes sure threats from the sinister areas of existence don't leak into this fragile planet. Of course, I'm not successful every time. Plenty of things slip through the cracks, seeing as you humans all seem to share your tales of encounters with things that don't follow the natural law. But I can assure you, it would be far worse if I wasn't around. I wasn't born human. In fact, I really didn't have a birth at all in the conventional sense. One moment it was nothing, not even black, and another, I was speaking to our director of operations as he explained my purpose to me, and I was able to understand and comprehend what he was saying right from the beginning. When there's a threat that conventional law enforcement and armed forces can't understand or take care of via traditional protocols and weapons, that's where I come in. I deal with the things that go bump in the night. That's my purpose, my drive, and what I was created for. Over the decades, I've been sent to either kill or more rarely capture everything from Wendigos to Yetis. I've done battle with all sorts of creatures, ones that pose serious threats to you humans and your communities. Now, as far as my appearance and abilities go, my height ends just at 8 feet. My skin is a midnight blue with a slight shine at the edges of my joints. My eyes are a pair of yellow-colored, glowing light bulb shaped masses. I possess claws about 4 inches long, razor sharp and strong enough to slice through most metals. When on all fours, I can sprint fast enough to keep pace with a speeding motor vehicle. In July 2011, I was deployed to White Mountain National Forest. There had been reports of some sort of creature snatching up campers in the night. There were 12 victims of the supposed cryptid. Only one had survived. He told his story to the police. They had taken his information down and then had secretly passed it on to us. When the surviving witness was brought in for questioning, he gave a vivid and very detailed account. After which, the agency had enacted protocol and taken care of him, as I was told. The same as they had done to many other witnesses. The look on the director of operations' face while the man had given his account to us was one of bafflement. Because from the creature that was described, this was going to be one of our most dangerous missions yet. As such, we prepped extra intensely for the operation. It wasn't long after the interview when I and a team of agents had been deployed to go take the cryptid down. Now that we knew where it was hiding and hunting, as well as what it looked like. I had no view of the scenery on the way there. I was transported inside a reinforced truck. It was more or less meant to hide my appearance from the public rather than to keep me contained in any way. They dropped me off at the edge of the forest, which had been closed off in order to keep anyone from witnessing what was about to take place. Several men geared up with night vision goggles, fully loaded assault rifles, and covered head to toe in body armor all followed behind me. As soon as we exited the truck, I crawled up a tree on all fours and moved from above, jumping from branch to branch to see if I could spot anything from the vantage point. I hissed and sniffed the air, trying to detect the creature's scent to no avail. Usually, this method was rather reliable, but this scripted knew how to mask its scent well. The agents below were getting tense during the hike. They took a sense something wrong. I could hear the intensity of their breathing increase, even underneath their masks. Where is this damn thing at? One complained. We've been out here for half an hour now. I ignored them and led the way, crawling down from the trees above and back onto the ground. 
I stood up in a bipedal fashion, letting myself tower over the agents as they looked up at me. Well, what about you, freak? The one closest to the front spoke up. You sense anything? For the most part, I brushed this comment off. I was more than used to ridicule for my appearance. It was nothing new. Although their use of the word freak had become excessive. And for some reason, it vexed me in a way I couldn't put into words. I got down on all fours and crawled around through some of the shrubbery off the path, doing everything in my power to use stealth and swiftness while being cautious about our surroundings. When I had run ahead and gotten only a matter of several yards from the rest of the squad, I picked up the smell of blood. A lot of it. I winced slightly from how hard the scent had hit me. I turned and dashed back over to the squad and informed them that I picked up a scent, to which they became uneasy, clearly unsettled by the lack of visual on the threat. What is it? One asked. Blood. I replied simply, my voice echoing off the tree surrounding us. The squad followed behind me as I led them in the direction of the scent, keeping their guns trained on the area around them with every step they took. A few of them even complained about the smell once they were in range to detect it. Jesus, that's pungent. One cried before leaning into his arm to cough. There was an extended period of silence that accompanied our march. No rustling of trees, no dislodgement of rocks, and even no wind. When things were this quiet, it usually meant something was nearby, a predator of some kind. I kept a lookout through the tree line, but couldn't spot anything, my night vision doing nothing to assist our predicament. Keep your heads up, came one of the squad members. It's gonna be close. And as if on cue, I felt something moving below me. I could feel its vibrations making contact with my feet. The creature was on the ground, and it was pressing forward in a slithering-like motion. But I could sense multiple sources of those vibrations, giving me the impression there was more than one body of mass below. I turned around to signal to the squad something was coming. But before they could comprehend my warning, a pair of long yellow-colored tentacles burst up from the soil, grabbing two of the agents and wrapping them around with a crushingly tight grip. FIRE! A few squad members shouted simultaneously, attempting to bring the monstrosity down. The gunfire rang out through the forest, only accompanied by agonizing screams of terror. The men in the clutches of the tentacles kicked and fought for their lives, but it was futile. I lunged at the pair of tentacles and slashed at one of them with my claws, <gasps> trying to sever them in order to save the agent that had been grabbed. A thick yellow paw spilled out from the limp each time I swiped at it. As a result, a piercing, almost ear-shattering screech erupted from below the ground. I bared my teeth at the pain as it rattled my eardrums, but nonetheless, I had to keep trying. Once I had taken out the first tentacle, the agent who had been grabbed was strapped to the ground in a lifeless fashion, evidently perishing from asphyxiation. His eyes bulged out of his skull while his mouth was still ajar from the house of agony. Those of us who remained turned our attention to the second tentacle. But the creature had adapted its attack methods, using the squat member in its grasp as a human battering ram to swat away the other agents. They were all knocked on their backs, sent into trees, and thrashed around like they were small children, all of them on the ground coughing and choking as they groaned from the bruises and even broken bones. I attacked the tentacle as best as I could, avoiding two swings and being mere inches away from getting clobbered by a third. I slashed at the bottom of the limb, and the pus leaked out in the soil and pulled on the ground. The agent in this tentacle's grasp had fared even worse than the first. Not only had he been brutally asphyxiated, but his neck was horribly disfigured and broken from all the blows he had been used to carry out. The other squad members attempted to get to their feet and raise their weapons, but several more tentacles had crashed up through the ground and grabbed them, sealing their fates. Three of the agents fired their guns in an unhinged and frantic panic, as a futile effort to escape the cryptid's grasp. When I attempted to get down on all fours and sprint towards the men to help, 
I too was grabbed by both my legs, being dragged backward before also having my arms restricted. I couldn't move or break myself free. I tried to retract my claws to slash the tentacles holding me back, but it was no use. My nails couldn't reach, and despite utilizing all my strength, it wasn't enough. Without warning, a deep booming voice then invaded its way into my eardrums. From what I heard, it appeared to be coming from all directions at once, as if it were above ground instead of below. You shall watch. It demanded with a vexed snarl. Then, all the agents who had been grabbed were not just simply having their airflow restricted this time, they were being pulled apart. Arms, legs, heads, all of it. Blood stained the soil as their horrendous screams were violently cut short. The smell of their viscera became overwhelming. Eventually, all of the screaming stopped, and the last agent had finally perished, which at this point in time was mercy. The forest returned to eerie silence. The tentacle had tightened its grip around me, making sure to keep me in place as I peered at the sight of all the deceased agents. Not a single survivor remained other than myself. These humans. That same voice from earlier on boomed. They are nothing. A mere inconvenience to you and me. They will cast you out and look at you like you are of no value. And yet you help them like the fool you are. Why is that? You have all this power, knowledge of things they do not. You could slit their throats and snap their bones in an instant. But you allow them to order you around as if you are their puppet. When really, they should all be yours. Let me go. I snarled slowly. Why do you think I didn't kill you? I want you to see that you do not belong to them. A being like you was meant to roam free. To be feared. I want them to bow to us. Not the alternative. We could take everything they hold dear with ease, yet we're forced to reside in the shadows, hiding away like scared prey. I protect them, and they feed me. I retort. What? Scraps? That sustenance is not meant for beasts like you. They will never truly care about you. You are the material of a king but continue to play the role of a pawn. You stand in a room surrounded by them, being docile for their sake. But you are the superior being. You know it, and so do I. They're alive because you allow it, not because they command it. It was at this point that I fully realized I was out of options, and fighting this creature head to head would only end in my death and the death of many others. So instead, I manifested a different approach. What do you want? What do I need to do? I inquired in the most sincere tone I could muster. The cryptid fell silent, attempting to contemplate my statement and gauge the validity of what I was saying. Why the sudden change of heart? It asked, a tone of suspicion present. I have looked back on my existence. I have seen what they truly want from me, now that I rethink everything they have said and done to me. I am nothing but an experiment to them, a means to carry out the things those coward can hope to. The creature began to laugh, clearly amused by my passionate lie. I couldn't conclude whether he was buying it or not. He began to speak again, this time much less forcefully. We belong out here, not in those prisons. No matter how much they pass it off as sanctuary, they are nothing but chambers to keep us and our true power locked away. They know what we can do. Why do you think those in power try to hide our existence from the rest? They fear the devastation we can cause, not only to their frail bodies, but to their minds. They want to keep us reserved to their nightmares, their dark tales, and their fantasies in order to feel safe, to have a false perception of control. A level of control they will never have in their short mortal lives. Then, between the sets of tentacles, a bulge began to form in the dirt, 
one that had a relatively humanoid shape. The soil, stones and bushes below had been displaced by the mass digging its way up to the surface. I edged myself closer, giving him a convincing grin to emote at his proposals, doing everything I could to make it seem like I was seen concurring with his ideals. Just when I was within leaping range, he returned my smile with a mischievous smirk of his own, allowing all of his disfigured teeth to show themselves. I then lunged forward and perched myself around his head and shoulders, sinking my claws and teeth into his scaly rubbery skin. That same runny yellow pus oozed out from his wounds as I clawed and bit him. His screams were powerful enough to shake the foundations of a building. He thrashed his body and used a tentacle to grab me in a final desperate attempt at survival as his life force drained itself from him. His limp wrapped around my torso, and I was thrown with sufficient force to go smashing right through the trunk of an oak tree, doing multiple somersaults backward as I tumbled along the ground. However, I seized a small window to sink my claws into the ground, slowing down and eventually halting my momentum. I quickly got back up on all fours, readying myself for an attack that never came. The cryptid's screams were now beginning to fade. He dropped to his knees as his tentacles continued to throw themselves wildly around the area, nearly clipping me in the process. I latched onto one of the trees and ran up to the top, watching his dramatic death come to an end. Even though he had no eyes, he spent his last few seconds of life glaring at me with a damning expression, telling me that I would soon meet him in hell and pay for what I had done. His movements of desperation were inconsequential. The trees around me shook as he fell back and took his seemingly final breath. I gave myself a few moments to decide if it was safe, and then cautiously crawled my way back to the ground, listening for any signs of life. I poked at one of his connected tentacles. There was no movement or any sort of reaction. So, I then made my way over to his body mass to inspect it. Only when I saw it again did it occur to me how much damage I had actually done. The pierced wounds from my claws and teeth had torn away most of the flesh from the top of his head. Some of the tissue near his mouth had been peeled off, as well as what I assumed to be a spring was exposed. I was now out here stranded alone with no sort of backup. All the agents were dead, and communication systems were destroyed. I didn't know how to get back to the base seeing as I had prevented from glimpsing at my surroundings during the trip. But it had been some time since my last meal, and hunger began to overcome me. I saw no other choice and came to the conclusion of what needed to be done. I looked around before kneeling down and beginning to feed on the corpse of the creature, making quick work of his flesh and picking off everything I could from his bones. The taste was somewhat sour, but I couldn't have cared less. I was hungry, and that was that. But in the middle of my frantic impromptu feast, I had figured I should speed up. I didn't want anyone who would have potentially been in the forest to come check out all the commotion and see me, despite the fact the agency ordered the government to close the place up prior to this disaster of omission. Once my meal was finished, I rose up on two legs, looking and sniffing around for any signs of life anyone or anything that could have been watching me. I had figured the agency would come and send more men once they realized we hadn't returned on the scheduled time. But in the back of my mind, I didn't want that to be the case. The things that the entity said were hard to shake from my psyche. If that thing had been right about something, it was that I should embrace what I am. I still didn't hate humanity nor did I want to do them any harm, but rather, I wanted to be able to make more of my own decisions and choices, to eat whatever I wanted, to roam wherever I please, not having to carry the burden of killing beasts for someone else. And after the past two decades of doing so, maybe this was my opportunity to let go and move on. Perhaps I would change my mind after some time after being out on my own. But I might also not. I guess only time would be able to tell. But if I did leave, if I did abandon the agency, it wasn't a choice I could simply reverse without consequence. I contemplated it 
for I'm not sure how long. I know they would come looking for me when they find out. That much was obvious. So, if I was gonna get out of here, I needed to do it now and be quick. I couldn't ever come back. They would more likely kill me if they sensed I had gone rogue. I turned around, giving one last glance to all the death and destruction behind me. I stared at the corpses of what were once my comrades, and while they were often cruel in their words and behaviors towards me, none of them deserved the death so gruesome. I know what I truly am, a creature of the night, the subject of urban legends, the presence you feel glaring at you through your window at night, but can't turn your head to face. Heed this warning. Do not come looking for me. Do not try to capture, kill, or disturb me. I promise, it will not end well for you. Leave me be. I am what I am. Nothing, and no one, can change that now. All my life, I had been a puppet without realizing it, spending every waking second taking orders from others without my input ever being considered. But now I understand why you humans praise freedom so much. It's exhilarating, cathartic, and an experience unlike any other. Being able to make my own choices and create my own destiny is one I thought I'd never have until now. Ever since I ran off from the agency and left it all behind, I've been roaming the forest for a few days now, feasting on such things as squirrels, rabbits, deer, and even a black bear at one point. And of course, other cryptids. A few days back, I was reminded by an enemy that I do not have a name. I hadn't been thinking about it at the time. It was never really something that was on my mind often. The agency had never bothered to give me one. Not an official one anyway. So I took the initiative to give myself one, going through many that didn't suit or fit me. It took a lot of trial and error before I finally settled on. Braun. Not that I really have anyone around to ever use it. You see, I'm alone out here. I have to be. The government, the agency, they're looking for me. I'm their multi-million dollar killing machine and I ran away. There is no way in hell they would just let that slide. I need to keep moving. Bringing others with me would only slow me down and probably get them killed as well. I preferred to move around and migrate at night. That way I had less of a chance of running into humans. It was more for my safety than theirs. I am a cryptid after all. If one gets a good look at me, they could report me to the agency once they come back out here to begin their search. I wasn't gonna take that chance, so I did everything in my power to avoid them at all costs. I kept myself low, crawling around on all fours to stay hidden behind bushes and in the shadows. This whole thing would be much easier if humans were the only thing I needed to avoid. But no, I also had to deal with the other cryptids, most of which did not take kindly to my presence in their territory. In the span of only about half a week, I had already encountered giant arachnids and insects. Shadow spirits with red eyes who seem to love the dark for whatever reason, as well as the more common windigos and skinwalkers. This forest had it all. If you were looking to die a horrible death by cryptid, this was definitely the place to do it. On one night, I was moving through the vegetation as usual, trying to find some living sustenance that wasn't hikers or campers. God. There were so many, I had to change directions multiple times when some of them decided to step off the trail, nearly causing me to be spotted and given away. The forest was just right. It didn't feel like how it did on most nights. No eerie silence, but it wasn't too loud either. The sounds of humans talking amongst themselves around their campfires was oddly peaceful to me. However, when I had come across one particular campsite of what appeared to be adolescents all laughing and conversing, I noticed something off in the distance watching them from behind a tree. Something tall but thin, far too big to be another human. It was stalking them, sizing them up like any other predator would do with their prey. 
I cut down on all fours and scaled my way up the closest tree next to me, seeing if I could get a better look at the creature by using a vantage point. My vision allowed me to see well in the dark, so that wasn't the problem. It was the way the creature's body was angled. Something was off about him, even by a cryptid's standards. I etched myself forward on one of the branches in the tree, waiting for the being to make any sudden movements, digging my claw into the park for extra grip. The humans hadn't noticed the creature's presence yet. They still sat there mindlessly consuming their strange-looking beverages. The last thing I wanted to do was get noticed by these people. But they were in danger. I wanted to help. I don't know why the urge was so strong. I just felt like I was obligated to. I've got to take a whiz. I'll be back in a sec. One of them announced to the rest. He got up off his lock and turned around to walk into the trees. The cryptid began to slowly move from his spot as he stalked the boy, keeping himself quiet as to not snap any twigs or make a sound. I made my way down the tree and circled over behind the creature, hoping to catch him off guard without being noticed. Now that I had gotten a better look at what it truly was, even I was taken aback by its appearance. The creature was only around a foot shorter than me, standing about seven feet high. It possessed a multitude of legs, and by that I mean an ungodly amount, giving most centipedes a run for their money. Above all those pairs of legs sat a thin body, no more than just a couple inches in width. Its torso, chest, and abdomen were all the same thickness. This creature practically had the build of a leaf rake. On top of that thin body rested its head, a long, also thin rectangle that was just as far off to its sides as its legs. The cryptid also had a set of three green triangular-shaped eyes on each end of its rectangular head, as if it were some sort of hammerhead shark gone wrong. The boy had just made it to a tree and stopped, presumably about to begin urinating. The entity slowly crept up from behind. I sped up my slow crawl towards it, wanting to get to it before I was able to grab a hold of the unsuspecting victim. Once the creature was in range to snatch up its prey, one of its supposed legs extended outward from below and stretched itself towards the boy, less than a foot from wrapping itself around his skinny neck without him having a single clue. I quickly got up on my hind legs and lunged between them, reaching out with one of my arms and slashing the limb right off causing the cryptid to wail and stumble backward in surprise as he cried out in pain. The boy turned to see both of us. He was frightened beyond comprehension and completely paralyzed, having no idea what to do next. I didn't blame him. Go! I barked. Now! You will die if you stay here! Him hearing me speak had snapped him out of his trance. He screamed for his peers and ran back into the clearing where their campsite had been set up. What the hell is that? One of the females said before letting out a blood-curdling screech. We gotta go. Get to the truck now. Another chimed in, just as frightened as the rest. They quickly began to run off and retreat, now leaving me alone with the other cryptid. You dare step foot into my territory and allow my prey to escape. It snarled at me in a loud hissing fashion. Still clutching the limb I had sliced off with my claws, I bared my teeth, preparing myself for the inevitable battle. The humans are to be left alone. Leave them be, I growled. Their flesh is far too delicate and delectable to be left alone. They taste magnificent. You will die for what you have done. <laughs> The entity reached out again with another one of those hairy deformed legs, this time much faster and more aggressive than it had done with the boy. The leg had moved swifter than what I had originally predicted. I attempted to slash it off like I had done the other, but missed, causing the leg to pierce me just below my left shoulder. I howled as I felt it sink into my skin, blood just as blue as my complexion leaked out from the wound, as I wrapped one hand around the leg and tried to pull it out of my flesh only for the creature to force it in deeper as he boasted. Such a weak one, aren't you? I expected much more. You are just as frail as the two-legged ones. It must be crushing to know your passionate efforts to protect them are so hopelessly futile. 
you will die like any mortal man. I felt rage begin to boil within me. I tilted my head up at the thing, glaring deeply into his soul to let him know I wouldn't be put down this easily. Even though it was painful, I shifted my body around the leg that had been currently impaling me and latched my jaws on it, biting down hard and not letting go. The entity screamed once again, extending out more of its legs to attack me. I swatted them away with my claws as I thrashed and snapped my jaws repeatedly on the one in my mouth, repeatedly biting over and over until I had finally dismembered him. Once it had been disconnected, I grabbed what was left of the first one in my shoulder and pulled it out while forcefully gritting my teeth and crawling at the ground below me. It stung like crazy, but I didn't have time to moan about it. In a bipedal stance, I took a couple steps back. The cryptid and I now being wounded meant that we were going to do anything we could to kill the other and walk out of this alive. Perhaps you are stronger than what I had previously predicted. He laughed tauntingly. I quickly latched onto one of the trees next to me, only crawling halfway up before leaping to the one next to it, repeating the process over and over until I got closer to him. He tried and failed multiple times to grab me as I was moving from tree to tree, going far too quick for his legs to reach me. I could hear him snarl under his breath, cursing himself for not being able to stop my repetitive jumping and leaping. Once I had gotten under the tree closest to him, the cryptid backed up, clearly understanding my intentions. He reached out with one of those legs one last time, to which I countered last second by snapping a large branch off the tree and holding it in front of me, deflecting his limb. I then threw the branch at the body of the creature, hitting him directly in the middle of his body and causing him to fall backward. I seized the opportunity by jumping from the tree and pouncing on him, quickly holding him down while I swiped my claws at his throat for the final and very much fatal attack. His screams were a hissing gurgle, despite the fact he didn't even seem to have any sort of blood or liquid that would indicate signs of a wound. But I could tell these were his last few breaths. W why He pleaded. The arrogance he had displayed earlier now slowly fading from his demeanor. In only a matter of seconds, his confidence had completely disappeared, now being replaced with pessimistic acceptance. You try to take their lives, so I took yours. I snapped. They did nothing to earn your wrath. What even are you? He gasped in his last few seconds of life. My name is Bron. I felt his body go limp in the grip of my claws, signaling he had drawn his last breath and his heart had stopped, if he even had one. The truth was, I didn't care, because I was hungry, hungry to feed once again. I needed to eat, this was a blessing in disguise. I glanced behind me and to the sides of me, making sure no humans or other cryptids were around to witness my feast. I tore into the creature greedily. I hadn't eaten anything since the previous day. And let me tell you, my appetite was not easily satisfied. I had devoured most of his legs and took a decent chunk of his head. That was the thickest part of him after all. The texture of his flesh was unlike anything I had felt before. He didn't even taste all that great, but I kept at it nonetheless. Luckily, his lack of blood would leave less evidence for the agency to find if they scouted out this particular area. That was the main thing I cared about. But, to my deeply frustrating surprise, I heard the sudden sound of a twig snap in the distance behind me. It wasn't very far. I got angry with myself internally for not dragging the beast somewhere more secluded before I started feasting. Whatever had made the sound was close. Definitely close enough to see what was going on. I stopped consuming my meal and dropped what remained of the creature's body, trying to look around for the source of the noise. At first, I was confused. My vision had been designed to be highly effective in the dark. I would have seen whatever was around me without much trouble. Unless it was an entity that possessed the ability to cloak itself. I had run into a few of those back when I was still with the agency. I decided to look slightly lower, 
looking straight ahead from my height, did slightly limit my line of sight. It only took me a few moments to spot a bipedal silhouette crouching down behind a line of thick bushes. It didn't appear very large, height or width twice. I cautiously lowered myself onto all fours and walked up to the left to circle around the figure and give myself the advantage. After breaking past the line of bushes and onto the other side, I was able to get a better picture of the creature who had been watching me. It was only a human, a male at that, holding a small rectangular shaped metal object in one of his hands, pointing it directly at me. A cell phone? I thought. I used to hear the soldiers at the agency talk about and use them all the time, but I had never actually seen one up close or in person. But it looked mostly like what I had expected. The closest thing to it I had ever come in contact with was the cameras the agency used to keep a watch on the premises of our building. The man froze. He was clearly terrified at seeing me. Even more than the boy from earlier. Not that I could help it. But I wanted to use that to my advantage. I had a plan in mind. I withdrew my claws, allowing them to gleam in the moonlight, which only frightened him further causing him to involuntarily raise his arms to shield himself. Who, what are you? His voice trembled. He backed up slowly, being hasty yet careful with his movements. Leave, now! I growled, baring my teeth. I reached out and pointed one of my lengthy fingernails at his cell phone. Drop it, I demanded. Please don't eat me, I mean no harm, I swear, please! He pleaded as he let his cell phone hit the ground. I will tear the flesh from your bones if you do not go. Now, I said, retracting my claws to enhance the bluff. He finally turned tail and ran. I was pretty sure I could hear him tearing up as he dashed through the trees, clearly deeply disturbed about our encounter. I crawled over to the cell phone. It was still seemingly turned on. The screen displayed a video which was something I was previously familiar with, but no expert by any means. Like I said, I had seen some of the cars at the facility operate them, but I had never done it myself. The video depicted me and the other creature I had killed in order to protect the campers and feed myself. It recorded everything up until I had run up on all fours and stood in front of the man. He was videotaping the whole thing, even as we fought each other to the death. I knew what had to be done. I let the cell phone rest in the center of my palm, just for a few seconds, right before clamping down and crushing it with brute strength. I opened my hand back up to find it cracked and broken into several pieces. The last thing I needed was the agency getting a hold of that. It was evidence. And it may seem extreme when I say it, but they would surely be able to track down my location if they were to find it. If they had been careful now to show me the full extent of their technological power. I didn't want to risk finding out. They already knew I was in this forest. That video would have been the final nail in the coffin if they saw it. I had planned to get out of here by the end of the night. It wouldn't be long before they would pay off the government officials to close this place down so they could set up teams to watch the exits and entrances. That is, if they hadn't already. At which point, I'd be completely trapped. The only way to get out would be to fight. And now would for sure have to fight to kill. I didn't want to shed so much blood when I didn't have to. I dug a hole in the ground using my hands, just deep enough to bury the remains of the crushed cell phone, this time being extra careful to make sure no one or nothing was watching me. After which, I got up and started my journey to get out of here. It took me a few hours to make it to the south end of the forest. The terrain had varied a lot during the journey. The main issue was just making sure I didn't cross paths with any more campers or hikers. I could see past the tree line and out into a highway. A mostly empty highway at that. All I needed to do was to be patient and cross at the right time. Every second turned into a minute as I approached it, getting closer little by little. No! Shouted a forceful voice from behind one of the trees. I quickly stood up on two legs, trying to gauge who had said the phrase, 
only to be met with sounds of multiple guns cocking and being loaded in all directions of me. In all my life, I had never been shot before. I wasn't sure if bullets were something that could harm me, but I didn't go down the foolish route and take the risk. I simply stood still and got down in a surrendering stance. Men from the agency were completely surrounding me, all geared up with night vision goggles and gas masks, completely armed to the teeth for a fight. They weren't playing around. Gas him. Dr. West wants him alive. One of the squad members proceeded to throw a small canister in front of me. It exploded and released a powerful yellow vapor that swiftly spread itself in the air and seeped into my orifices, causing me to slowly become weaker and lose my strength as the gas filled my lungs. I felt dizzy. Everything around me was spinning. I collapsed onto my back, unable to fight the gas and stay conscious. The sounds of footsteps and men all shouting a victorious chant were the last things I had heard, before blacking out. That and the smell of all their distinct scents. When I had awoken, a bright, almost blinding light pierced my eyes. I winced back from the dramatic shift as I tried to adjust myself accordingly. I was in an all-white room, surrounded by four thick glass walls. I assumed they had been heavily reinforced, but that didn't matter, because when I attempted to move forward to make eye contact with the glass, I found out I had been restrained by specially made chains wrapped around my arms, only just preventing me from touching the glass of the containment area. Subject 16A It's good to see you once again, said a calm female voice, far more welcoming than anything I'd ever heard before. I tilted my head downward. On the other side of the glass in front of me stood a middle-aged looking woman, blonde hair, brown eyes, dressed in a lab coat, her hair pulled back in an elegant ponytail. My name is Bron. I snapped at her, making no attempts to move or adjust myself with the chains restraining me. Is that what you call yourself now? She replied, letting out a forced chuckle. I guess that is shorter. So why not? I'm Dr. West. But you may as well call me mother. Let me go! I snarled, baring my teeth and ignoring her foolish request. Well, we just got you back. Can't do that just now, can we? I spent millions creating you. I designed you, made you the ultimate cryptid killing machine. We gave you food, shelter, and a place to stay in exchange for your services and obedience. But yet, you betray us. Why is that? Bron. She polished her sentence off, trying to hold off a laugh, clearly amused at the attempts to individualize myself. I want to be free. I like it out there. I shot back, now looking at the floor. Ah, but you see, it's not that simple, Bron. As I said, I created you. Years of research and dedication was put into making your existence a reality. You work for us. You are a part of us. Mother's orders. Dr. West punctuated by letting a manic grin creep up onto her face. This is a prison. I don't want to be here anymore. I have no real mother nor father. I am your experiment. You are not my mother. You never will be. I'd rather die than ever let that be the case. Wes stood back when I finished my tirade, seemingly genuinely shocked by my revelation. I am a puppet to you, nothing but your attack, Doc. Now let me go. I continued. Dr. West slowly inched closer towards the glass, nearly having her face pressed against it as she kept her arms placed behind her back. You know what you are? She erupted. You're a freak. The subject of every horrendous tale ever told. You are nothing but the fuel of nightmares and the cause of worldwide terror. No one out there will accept you. But we do. Those people don't care about you. When I designed you, I did it with the purpose of trading the looks for intelligence. But apparently, I failed at that too. Not only are you hideous, but you are a fool. Something in me snapped. I clenched my jaws and felt my blood boil. Before I even registered what I was doing, I 
charged at the glass. The chains held me back from it only less than a foot. She jumped back in surprise as I lifted a fingernail and pointed it at her face. When I get out of here, I hissed, showing as many teeth as possible for dramatic effect. You will be first. West simply smirked when she regained herself. She lifted her left hand from her back to reveal a small gray colored rectangular device with two red buttons on the front, along with an antenna sticking out at the top. We maintained eye contact as she slowly guided her thumb towards the button on the top. Was that a threat? She asked rhetorically. When she pressed the button, a massive electric shock exploded through my body, causing me to roar and screech within the chamber. They echoed loudly off the walls as I thrashed around, internally begging for the pain to stop. I had felt torment before, but nothing like this, not even close. We built you to be resistant to a lot, but we needed to give you some sort of Achilles heel. You know, for contingency purposes. There was no emotion left in her voice as she spoke. Her friendly attitude she had feigned earlier had completely disappeared. Now all I could see was a look of malice and hatred. She looked like she was barely containing her unhinged madness. My limbs were twitching after the excruciating shock had concluded. Smoke rose from the surface of my skin as I lay there defenseless, the chains now feeling even tighter around my wrists. It's sad to see such a waste of men hours and resources. She leaned down behind the glass, condescendingly. I try to tell you, try to convince you what it is you have here. But seeing as you are stubborn, we'll have to open up that head of yours and make a few adjustments. Maybe I'll leave you awake during the procedure to teach you a lesson. Dr. West, what are you doing? Said a more masculine voice, accompanied by the sound of rapid footsteps. It stung like crazy, but I turned my head to see whoever had stormed in. Being grateful, they had distracted Wes long enough for my healing abilities to kick in and help me recover. But I healed much slower than normal. Wes was right. The electricity was my weakness. This male voice also wore a lab coat, seemingly a doctor as well. He raced over to Wes and attempted to grab the device from her. He's turned, John. He's going to places he shouldn't be going and abandon a mission site. She shouted, holding out an arm for John to keep his distance. That doesn't mean you shock him, you moron. We need him strong, able to fight. This is only going to make things worse. He needs to be punished. West snapped back. He needs to learn he belongs to us, and he needs to obey. You know what would happen once he begins to think he's the one in charge? John took a deep breath. I'm not going to ask again, doctor. Give me the remote. Now. West once again refused, attempting to run away but being grabbed by John as he tried to snag the remote away from her. No, stop! Dr. West pleaded. He's too dangerous. Give me the damn remote, West. John yelled as his thumb slipped onto the button in all of the chaos of their struggle. Suddenly, the chains wrapped around my arms unlocked and disconnected themselves. The reinforced glass walls of the room lowered down into the floor. I was now free to move around. As fast as possible, I threw the chains off and stood up, still feeling slightly weak from my intense electric shock, but retaining enough strength to fight should I have to resort to doing so. West and John both stopped and dropped the remote inattentively, both turning their heads to look up at me as I towered over them. I could see John's legs shaking as he sized me up. I could literally smell the fear coming off of them. Run! West shouted, turning around and sprinting for the door that led into a brightly lit hallway, clearly having no remorse for leaving John behind with me. Once John's adrenaline kicked in, he too had turned to run, but not before I quickly dashed and leaped across the floor, grabbing him by the shoulder and lifting him up to eye level. He was terrified, shaking, kicking and screaming begging for me to let him go. I could tell he was surely close to urinating. I, I'm sorry, I really am. I cut him off, lowering him back to the ground before saying, You may go, but the West is mine. I told him, giving him a look that told him my statement was non-negotiable. 
he had seemed more than fine with that proposal. He quickly nodded and ran out of the room, both horrified and grateful that I had chosen to spare his life. The alarm system in the building began to ring. A female voice came over the intercom, endlessly repeating the phrase, Security breach level 5. All possible agents engage. Heavy footsteps began to ring out through the hall next to the chamber room I was in. It was a multitude of agents coming my way, all more than likely armed with that same gas they had used to subdue me earlier. I didn't want to risk fighting them and getting caught once again. God knows what Dr. West would do to me the second time around. And it would all be just to prove a point. Not a damn thing to do with science. I looked all around the room for any sign of an escape, desperate to get out of this nightmare of a room. I was greatly relieved when I looked directly above me and spotted a large air duct cover. I was very tall, but skinny enough to fit through it widthwise. I didn't have any other options. It was either this or suffer endless torture at the hands of West. The footsteps were getting closer. I could hear the voices of the agents as they ran down information towards the room. I had to act quickly. I got on all fours, latched myself onto the nearest wall, and crawled up onto the ceiling from there. I scurried across and stopped at the duct, reaching over with one hand to grab and tear off the cover, making sure to bring it with me, not wanting the agents to see it. At least, not at first. It would hopefully buy me a few more minutes before they had realized where I had gone. I quickly crawled up inside the vent, hearing the agents enter the room and curse violently as they tried to spot me to no avail. I scurried deeper into the tight tunnels, making sure not to scrape my claws against the metal or make any sounds that could be heard over the alarms. I had remembered the layout of the building from all the previous years I had spent here. The chamber room was new to me though. I had never been in there before. Up until now, I was obedient and followed their orders. But I was sure as hell done doing that. I crawled over towards the security room. I had remembered seeing agents always going in there before we went off to go hunt down a cryptid. I picked up Dr. West's scent coming from it. Looking through the duct cover from an aerial view, I spotted her sitting in a chair with a glass of water in her hand, while two guards stood in front of the door to the room, keeping their assault rifles trained on it. Don't worry, Doc. If he comes in here, we'll blow him away. I sniffed around a little bit more, seeing if I could pick up the sense of anyone else in the room just in case. But all I had gotten was West and the two guards. I prepared myself to attack. I needed to be fast and take the guards out before they could alert any others to my position. Using stealth and precision, I slowly reached my claws outwards and locked them around the air duct cover, gripping it firmly before ever so slowly pulling it off and up into the vent tunnels. You two idiots better make sure he doesn't get through that door, because if he does, I'll run while he tears your organs out. Dr. West shouted angrily at the two guards. They didn't respond as I moved out of the vent and began to cautiously creep along the ceiling in their direction keeping my movements slow and deliberate. So far, they and West hadn't taken notice of my presence. I made it above the guards and quickly dropped down, swatting the first guard away with a casual backhand. He was sent flying across the room, slamming into a table and getting knocked unconscious. Stacks of paper scattered as he and the table tipped backward onto the floor. The other guard quickly reached for his radio and tried to call for backup. I cut him off by grabbing him and slamming him headfirst into the wall. He too was now out cold. After they had both been taken care of, I turned my attention to Dr. West. She had already backed up to the far side of the room. The existential fear was palpable in her expression. Stand down, now! She commanded desperately. That's an order 16A! I stood up bipedally, raising my claws and showing my teeth as I walked toward her. I will not say it again. My name is Bron. I growled. Get away from me, now! She cried. I ignored her demand, still keeping my purposefully sluggish pace as I closed in on her, wanting her to feel small, 
insignificant and weak. I should have killed you. I should have let you starve. Waste away. Clearly, I've shown far too much mercy. No. I stopped there. It is I who has shown too much mercy. Kill me then, you freak. She began to laugh maniacally. Do it. That's what I designed you to do. To kill. So why aren't you doing it? You spirited John, the guards. You can't even complete the simple tasks you were created to do. The looming threat of her potential death had sent her into a senile state. She was no longer able to mask her deep-rooted insanity. You designed me to kill monsters. I corrected her, right before drawing my claws back and slashing her throat. She clutched her neck as blood spewed out from her fatal wound. Sounds of gurgling and choking filled the room as she fell to her knees, going white right in her last agonizing seconds of life. I didn't get any time to gloat over her corpse. More security personnel were already outside the door. Dr. West, is everything okay in there? Came voices from the other side of the door, followed by forceful banging. Dr. West, please let us know you're okay, or we will force the door open. I knew I didn't have much time. I grabbed West's corpse before scaling the wall and crawling back up into the vent. Back inside the air ducts, I devoured what was left of the sinister doctor. My creator. My sick, twisted and evil creator, who threatened me with torture and death for simply wanting more than the totalitarian restrictions I was given here. And they called me the monster. I ate quickly. I made sure to pick her bones clean, leaving nothing but her skeleton and hair. This duct would be her final resting place. It's exactly what she deserved. I navigated through the rest of the ducks until I reached the south end of the building. The alert was still going. Agents were still scrambling and looking for me, as well as Dr. West now. They wouldn't stop. They wouldn't give up. I just knew they wouldn't. Especially once they figured out I had killed West. The duct that was in eventually ended and opened up to a decently sized room, filled with all sorts of pipes and boilers. I was in the walls of the building. They were dark, slightly damp, filled to the brim with unkempt spiderwebs and insect nests. It would be too obvious to leave, at least for now, especially going and hiding out in White Mountain Forest again, or any forest in the area for that matter. I know what I was going to do. For now, I would stay living within the walls of the facility, right under their noses sneaking around the ducks and feasting on whatever vermins and small creatures I could get my claws on. It was perfect. While they would be out scrambling to look for me, I would be here, hiding in plain sight, just until I could come up with something better. I needed to wait for it all to die down. By this point, I know they will never accept me, love me, or care for me. I've accepted it. I should have a long time ago. But I promise you one thing. I will make it out of here someday soon. I will be back out in the world, helping your species battle the dark forces of the universe. Call me a monster all you like. But monsters come in all forms. I am only one example. Men, women and children can all be monsters. We all have the capability to be cruel merciless and evil. Monsters don't just appear in dark legends and myths. They could be sitting right next to you, living in your home. Or worse, living in your soul. Residing in the very heart and spirit you used to tell yourself that you are benevolent. <laughs>